Hi everyone, I'm Kevin. I work on uh, business development here at Wolfram. Um, the Eureka program is a new program that we just started a few months ago. The goal of the program is where we're hoping to help guide and um, guide aspiring entrepreneurs as they launch or build their startup. And we're hoping to foster networking within the group as well. So uh, we'll be hosting one or two events a month and members of Eureka will be able to attend those events. We've already held, I think it's three um, really successful events so far and we have a lot more planned. If you're interested in applying for Eureka, I think the, the link is on Passable. Um, so today we're really excited to be holding our fourth event at uh, WTC and opening it up today uh, to the WTC crowd. Um, we wanna make sure that we're designing and holding events that are impactful. So if you have a chance at the end, please leave us some feedback on Passable. Um, we'll also have time at the end for Q&A. So feel free to leave your questions in the chat and I'll you know, keep track of them throughout the event. Um, so with that, let me pass it over to John. Great, thanks Kevin. Uh, I'm John Woodard. Um, so here we have our inaugural kind of event where we're interviewing a founder and we're really excited and happy to have uh, Phil uh, Maiman. And the, the name of this segment, we're calling it My Eureka Moment. As you'll see, like we have a signature question around that. Um, Phil is a co-founder and CTO of Swipe.Bet, a tender for sports betting, offering you live in-game bets it thinks you will like and allowing you to swipe right to accept or left to pass. Um, I'd actually encourage you, if you can, to go to swipe.bet. There's actually a mailing list if you're interested in kind of learning more as uh, that story progresses. Um, I just first wanted to just start with the basics, Phil. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, your professional background, interests, and mm -hmm. how you kind of got into things. Uh, my background is I used to be a, a hedge fund manager. That was my first job out of college. Uh, uh, so I was a trader at uh, Long Term Capital and Ellington Management Group, and then my own hedge fund we had with my dad, um, where we traded behavioral relative value and stuff. Uh, then I went into academia. I went to get my PhD, and after that, you know, when you get your PhD, you have to you have to either go directly to become a professor or or kind of never, because because <laughs> if you wait a couple of years and then you try to become a professor like well, why haven't you published well I haven't published because I've been working you know it's like proprietary and stuff so I figured I'd give it a shot and that's been fun um and uh sorry am I having some feedback I, oh yeah, just there how's that better um uh when you so we started looking uh, uh, sports analytics evolved right about 10 years ago uh it like broke out of nowhere where suddenly it was like everywhere um and uh, me and my brother and a friend of ours, a uh, close friend, we started writing some papers on trying to take the tools and techniques of finance and apply it to sports analytics. Uh, and since then, my, you know, I started off as a professor of finance and risk engineering at NYU. Then I went to another place, Bridgeport, where I was finance and analytics. Now I'm at Fairfield, where I'm just analytics. I don't do finance anymore, just pure, <laughs> pure data now. So that's, that's me. That's where I've been at. Gotcha. So I have... A bunch of follow-up questions here because you've had like so many exciting experiences I think as you've developed. So one, long-term capital management, please tell us more about your experiences there and kind of what it was like at the end. What, what a wonderful place to work, wonderful people. And it was um, a couple of years ago, it was the 20 year anniversary of uh, 1998. It's crazy. Uh, so many people may not have heard even of long-term capital management. Yes. <laughs> it, it, it was the best hedge fund uh, ever at, at the time in 1998. We had two Nobel laureates as uh, daily active working partners, uh, Nobel laureates in, in economics. One of them is Myron Scholes. The other is Bob Merton. They both created, along with Fisher Black, the options pricing yes, model. Yes, like Black the Scholes. thing. <laughs> the thing. And they were the guys, and they were with us. And it was the... Uh, I learned a lot from them, not just about finance, but about business and life. Because you, when you start a company, the culture is really important. And they had such a flat structure. Everybody could approach everybody. Uh, you know, you have discussions with, with Myron Scholes or Bob Merton or John Merriweather. Like, and just, it's just chatting. It's amazing. Um, and, and they made everybody feel welcome and, and valued. Uh, so it was a great place to work. And then 1998 happened. And what happened in 1998 was uh, Russia defaulted on its domestic debt. There was a flight to quality. It was, it was kind of a wholesale uh, uh, problem rather than a retail problem. The stock market didn't move much, but a lot of the spreads blew out. And um, at the time, it's hard to imagine. This is 1998. There's like hardly any internet. So we'd be right. <laughs> checking emails in Bloomberg every morning. I was in Tokyo during the, the, 
the incident. Um, so we were fine, but we'd be checking every morning to see has Warren Buffett bought us yet or not. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, no, it's good. It's yeah, that's amazing because for me, it's like um, I took the course I took in finance in college with, with um, the guy at Yale. I forgot his name. It's embarrassing because I'm trying to actually humble Would brag. You, uh, <laughs> Nick Barbaris, um, maybe? He just won a Nobel in economics. Oh. Oh, uh, uh, I can't think of the name. But, but anyway, okay. so he, he would talk about hedge funds and Robert Schiller is the guy's name. Oh, of course. Yes, right. of course. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, but so he would talk about hedge funds and everything else. But I remember reading about long-term capital management in the New Yorker. Like this is just pre, pre-internet. It's hard to like think about the, the, the needs of time and everything. Yeah. Um, but tell us too about like being at NYU in finance. I know there's someone famous there as well. Um, what was that like? Oh, that was awesome. Um, that was a great department. Uh, so N- Nassim Taleb, also an Innovator Award winner, Wolfram user, Mathematica extraordinaire. Uh, he was there. We had great chats. Uh, it, it was a nice environment because it was very um, – uh, it wasn't the theoretical ivory tower kind of stuff that finance can sometimes devolve into. It was very practical and hands-on, uh, real-world kind of uh, uh, kind of stuff, both with the derivatives valuations, but also kind of anything, uh, uh, even behavioral finance, algorithmic finance. Um, it was a, it was a hotbed of really interesting risk and eng- risk engineering activity. Gotcha. Yeah, and and I think you also talked about like your experiences with sports analytics, and this to me is like amazing because. There's all of these, you know, programs and movies and pop culture now with Moneyball and all these things. But it's like you're on the forefront of that, too. So, like, tell me about the, uh, the MIT Sloan Conference and what you kind of did there and maybe some of your experiences with that. Sure. So they started uh, about 10 years ago having a research paper track. The the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference is the largest sports analytics, maybe one of the largest conferences in the world. It has 3,000 people descend onto the convention center in Boston. And you know, you're walking around the halls and there's all these tall people. Uh, some of them are GMs, <laughs> some of them are players, you know, from the NBA. Uh, and most of the, most of the conference is these wonderful panels where it's like a thousand people in the room and they're discussing uh, what's the, what's a be- what's happening in the future of basketball or what's uh, esports or, or sports betting mm-hmm. um, with questions from the audience and Twitter and everything. Barack Obama spoke a couple years ago. Um, so it's a, it's a huge event. And about, eight, 10 years ago, something like that, they added a track, the research papers track, where people would submit uh, analytical research about the sport of their choice or a variety of sports. Um, And so we started submitting to that and and going, and it's just so wonderful. It's it's really hard to find a sports analytics event or venue where hundreds of people show up and you're like walking them through, you know, machine learning or regressions or something, you know? Uh, So it's a really wonderful experience. It's, it's something if, if you're interested in sports analytics, it's definitely good to go. They have a lot of additional helpful things like uh, career placement and advice and uh, uh, a hackathon and lots of other great things. So one of the things that, that interests me about like the sports analytics is this comparison of taking like um, financial kind of models and forgive me for like my lack of experience with finance, but like the, the financial sort of models and taking that and trying to, to look at like real world kind of things that coaches do and I think you have a story about that, and I'd really love to, to hear it, too. Yeah, that was the first paper we wrote with uh, my brother Alan and our friend Eugene Shen. We, uh, we thought, well, what's the easiest thing to prove that everyone's an idiot in basketball, right? <laughs> and we thought, well, this is clearly easy. Early foul trouble. You watch it all the time. A great player gets two fouls called on him in the first quarter. And you get in basketball, you get up to six fouls, then you're, you're disqualified. You can't play the rest of the game. But very rarely does anybody ever foul out. Uh, people just start playing less aggressively, less, more, more conservatively. Um, but in any case, when you get two early fouls, let's say in the first five, six minutes, you can watch any basketball game. As soon as this happens, the coach yanks them almost immediately um, because they want to keep them for later parts of the game. So we thought, this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous because they never foul out. So you're getting less minutes played by your best players, right? Just play them. Just play them. The points, a first quarter point is worth the same as a fourth quarter point. If the point is a point, you want to maximize the minutes played. If he fouls out, he fouls out once in a while. No big deal. Um, so we thought this would be really easy to prove. So we ran, like you said, the financial techniques, the simulations, the everything. And it turns out we were wrong. The coaches were right all along. 
Well, it, it was mind blowing. Uh, like there was, there were subtleties. Like we had mm -hmm. some things to suggest, but basically, uh, there are lots of times when it does make sense to pull your star. Uh, and keep them. And it's because of optionality, convexity. It's the fact that they can come back and play during a uh, an important clutch fourth quarter when it's a really close game. That optionality can outweigh their additional drift or the additional amount of uh, points they can earn for you early. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's, it's, it's just amazing to me. Um, and it seems like these sort of things kind of compounded in a way to like your experience in startups and doing stuff with sports and with with gaming um so this kind of leads up to our signature moment if we had live sound effects it'd be kind of cool but i'm gonna da, do da, da, da. <laughs> what was your eureka moment um with swipe.bet or in my life well well i guess we can <laughs> we can go through like several of them so we can go through like maybe your life is most important but then also we could talk about um, I think there's a couple of moments with swipe.bet as well. Um, yeah. So let's start with your life and then go to, to swipe.bet. Let's start with the important stuff first. Well, I don't, I don't know about my life. I could tell you uh, with Mathematica, I, when we were running our hedge fund with me and my dad, he had written some early stuff, I don't know, 20 years ago in, in Mathematica, uh, like a credit default current fault swap price. It was the first in the world. So he, he knew about the power and he introduced me to it. I remember reading the Mathematica book. I think it was for version four or five. And so I learned it and it was fun. But then what blew my mind, this was my first Eureka moment ever with, uh, with computers, I think, programming, was Manipulate. Were you alive when Manipulate came? I mean, version six, that was mind blowing. <laughs> Right, mind blowing. All the dynamic functionality. Now we take it all for granted. It's you know, sliders, big deal. But it was a uh, it was a major shift in in my head. Like that, it took me a while to really understand what was going on and and how that that was that could be possible. Um, with Swipe Bet, our first. So uh, I co-founded it with my with my partner uh, Brett McDonald, and we had worked at a previous uh, company together called Vantage Sports. I found Vantage because I was doing sports analytics, I was consulting for NBA teams and stuff. And what had happened in the NBA recently was optical tracking data. So this uh, six cameras on top of every arena on all 29 arenas looking down and capturing the center of mass 25 frames per second of all 10 players and the three referees and the x y <laughs> and z location of the ball so you could see how high it was mm -hmm. it was incredible so it was, it was a revolution in uh, sports analytics uh, which people don't understand but it's been happening people who think of sports analytics like money ball kind of stuff they think of regressions mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and kind of that kind of you know let's just uh, we, we there's a fight between the scouts and the and the, and the nerds or geeks or or whatever right but that's long gone like that 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 war has been fought that's over right <laughs> like, yes you have to do analytics um but the regression stuff doesn't work very well once you have these millions and billions of rows of location data the mm -hmm. tools that you need are more computational and artificial intelligence machine learning all this stuff uh, so that was the transition that was happening and uh, we found that one of the things that even with all the machine learning and even with all this data what was still missing in basketball you know we, we all play basketball. What is the most important thing? If you're taking a shot, what's the worst thing that can happen to you? What do you want to know on defense? What we can measure is how close the person was to you, who that person was, the shot clock. We know all that. But what we don't know, there's no data, not in any box score, not nowhere else, to tell you if the defender's hand was up. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. And you know, if the guy is putting his hands down, pff, easy, easy shot, right? Like, come on. But so things like that, or whether a, a, a pick was being set solidly or not, or whether a guy was cutting to the basket and looking for a pass, even if it didn't come. All these things that the human eye can see very, very easily, but computers could not. So we had a company that we had 50 people, full-time jobs. I was looking at these games. Was it a crossover left to right? Did it go behind his back? Did he pass? Every single thing, inc incredible amount of information. Uh, and the first Eureka uh, thought there was, okay, what's our next sport that we're going to do after basketball? We were thinking soccer, maybe. Um, but esports came out to be huge. Uh, and uh, I had never heard of esports at that point, and now I'm addicted to them. Um, esports e are, are, you know, they're sports, but it's just people pressing buttons on a computer uh, and people and Madison Square Garden, all these arenas sell out where people pack it. They buy the hot dogs and the popcorn. They're literally just watching five people on computers over here and five people on computers over there. Uh, so that was the first one is we realized there's something there. 
The next one, we started the basketball stuff. It was a unique form of data. So we started selling it to gamblers and they started using it to make uh, additional money. So that was good. So we realized there's something in the gambling market. When uh, gambling became essentially legalized uh, a year or so ago uh, in America, uh, we thought, what, what's going to happen? What, what would be a useful way to participate in this market because there's lots of sports books there's lots of casinos there's lots of uh, other ways of doing it but they're all kind of dirty and shady and you have to learn this ridiculous lingo of odds and whatever and yes yes unders and <laughs> money lines I, definitely i mean i i definitely know there because it's like i think i was just telling you before it's like i learned all the sports betting lingo from casino and other you know Las Vegas movies in terms of right. like, how would I even approach this? And it definitely like means that it just seems unapproachable where there are things like I would spend money for entertainment wise because I kind of understand them. So yeah. Yes. And all of that is not done for the benefit of the better. Obviously it's done for the benefit of the sports book. Cause those things are easier to, to hedge and to trade and to mm -hmm. manage the risk on. Um, it's really hard to offer a bet on something like, will LeBron James score five points in the next eight minutes, right? That's a hard bet to offer because if you just offer it to the world, somebody who knows that he was injured or knows that his opponent was injured can just lay down a huge amount of money and boom, you're out of business. Right. And, and mm -hmm. you're offering those thousands of times all the time. Um, but we thought that's the way to go. That's what people want, right? All the, the fact that gambling is now legal, people want to bet on meaningful in-game action, right? Mm -hmm. And they push sportsbook, please let me bet on live action. And the sportsbook, here, have, have a little. You could bet on like halftime scores or something. And then now look at all our other offerings, please. You know, upsell <laughs> over here. Um, but if we could focus on that area, that was the first, that was not quite a eureka because it was, we, we knew that was the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Right. We'd like to offer that something simple. Now, Tinder was really hot at the time. I think it's still hot. People know Tinder is right. right? easy. They, 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 you know, swipe right if you like something, mm -hmm. swipe left if you don't. We thought, well, what if we could do that with bets? That was the first thought to make things easy for people to bet. But then here mm -hmm. comes the eureka moment. And I'm happy to share this with you now because we, we just got a patent on it. So I can tell yes. you all, I will have all questions the details about that, too. Uh, all the details. <laughs> um, uh, uh, the idea is this. We're going to offer you. We want to make it as simple as possible. So first of all, no odds. Every bet that we're offering to you is you either – you pick a bet size initially, say 10 bucks, 100 bucks a bet. You either win 100 bucks or lose 100 bucks. There's no vig or commish or anyone to break your kneecaps or anything. And you're not even betting against us. This was the beautiful part. In every sports book, no matter how friendly their stock images are, their royalty-free stock images on the website, you're ultimately betting against the person that you're doing business with. Um, but with us, no, you're actually not betting against us. And our secret is this. We're going to offer you curated bets, just like Tinder. We're not going to say, here's a wide open deli style menu, pick what you want, throw in money. No, we, we know who you are. We've looked deep into your soul. And we also know your past betting experience and preferences. We think you would really like this live bet. LeBron, we think you like betting on LeBron scoring five points in the next eight minutes. If you continuously swipe left on those kind of offers, we'll eventually learn, okay, you don't like LeBron bets, fine. We'll offer you Steph Curry bets, whatever you want. Um, so you're, you're getting a curated, you get a deck of cards uh, live. We pick it out at the time. This is also cute. Uh, when do you offer these bets? You can't offer them like during a fast break, right? Because everything can change. Uh, so we find moments in every game that are lulls. How do you find a lull in a game? If you, you've all seen like win probability graphs, like here's mm -hmm. how the game is moving. Here's the win probability, how it changes over time. So we look at that. We have models of win probability and we look for when the volatility of the win probability is low, meaning it's not changing much. If the win probability is relatively stable, that means what's happening now is irrelevant. Maybe it's a timeout, maybe it's a free throw being shot, maybe it's someone arguing with the ref, who knows? But it's a, it could be near zero, it could be near one or anywhere in between, but it's a lull. At that moment, we'll start offering you bets and you'll start getting dings on your phone. Oh, look, it's a nice bet. Because this is the time when you'll be looking away from the on-court product anyway, right? And rather than going somewhere else, this is a way to keep you engaged. Uh, uh, so this is good for the sports teams, it's good for the leagues, it's good for TV. Um, you, we offer you some bets, you swipe right or left, and here, here's the thing, because we're offering it as curated, we can automatically balance the book. So you're not trading against us, you're trading against other people. Right. I mean, that, that to me is just amazing because it's almost like, just like finance and sports and like the engagement for the, um, 
the folks who are out there like watching, I mean, you're hitting them right at the moment where, as you said, they're like potentially looking away or maybe there are multiple games going on and they might, you know, have several TVs or do whatever, or, like move through different things. So it's like perfect because you're getting them involved in like a yeah. small, like slice of the game of that moment where you said like, oh, the next five minutes or the next two minutes, where now that's like a game in and of itself to pay attention to and mm -hmm. watch and root for. And that to me is amazing. Well um, put. That's, a, that's a really well put. That's exactly what it is. And, you're, and everybody's getting it at the same time. So if you're mm -hmm. playing with your friends, you can compete on roughly the same kind of opportunities and you can see who bet better, right? Right, right. Oh, absolutely. I didn't even think about that. But like that kind of um, highlights that, that competitive nature that people would have too and make it exciting for people – um, who aren't like with you at the moment, but are kind of playing yeah. with you at, like, or watching along with you too. It like makes that more interactive. It's yeah. just really amazing. I'm, I'm like, when you first told me about it, I was just like, oh, this is such a great idea. Um, so another thing with this is like, you talked about the patent process and going through that. Like, what was that like in terms of getting a technology patent? It was terrifying for me because it was my first one and I kept worrying that because at the same time we're, we're raising capital, we're talking to potential partners. So, you know, I didn't really want to tell them too much because what if we don't get the patent, you know, and then they could come in and compete with us or whatever. But thank God we got it. Uh, my partner, Brett, he uh, he never worried about it. Not for a second. He would always calm me down. Part of the reason is he's he has a background <laughs> in patent law. So good for him. Uh, but he knew that <laughs> right. we have a good one. Uh, so we filed a provisional patent. And then it just got approved. We're very excited. Um, and it got approved completely, like just 100%. Everything we uh, we put in there. Uh, so it's really innovative. It's, we're, we're really happy about that. Um, now I'm no longer terrified. So <laughs> yes. Well, congratulations two times, one for like <laughs> getting it. And then also for, <laughs> for like taking that down. Cause I, I kind of know, like, I think we, lots of entrepreneurs kind of know that like you have this eureka moment, you're working on things and then you're like, Oh my gosh, can I even protect this <laughs> from yeah. like the, the rabid, like kind of, um, close followers that may even get more advantage for like following like your hard work and idea and everything else. Um, so that's, that's, that's really congratulations on that. Thank you. And the patent, if, if you've seen patent law language, it's mm -hmm. so formal and weird. It looks like English, but it has these like weird phrases such as therefore the above. Right. And if you don't put them in, like you're screwed. So you really need a, a good patent yes. lawyer. It might be a fun application for Wolfram language to try to parse <laughs> it, right? And, and put it into a tree form because it's all very rigid, yep. but, but, you know, flowery English language. <laughs> yes, yes. Keeps lots of like patent agents, lawyers, <laughs> Patent examiners, yes, all like well employed. Um, <laughs> so, going back to like swipe.bet and kind of those those goals that you might have, what are kind of your short term, maybe six months to a year goals? So the biggest hurdle which we now have, have cleared is we we don't have a sports gambling right, license, right? And you have to go state by state and jurisdiction by jurisdiction. Uh, and you have to geofence the app so that even if you're legal in New Jersey and it's a New Jersey resident, but if they're not in New Jersey at the time they're placing the bet, you know, you call the cops. So we've, we've partnered with somebody who has the licenses. Um, and we're, so we're very excited about that. We're going to start launching games. The nice thing is because it's all built on uh, Wolf Language, it's, it's very flexible. We can add a new game in like a week or two, a brand new sport. We've done it before. We've done it for, for football, for basketball, for soccer. Um, I think one more at baseball. So adding a new one takes only a week or two. Uh, so we're going to probably start with uh, hockey or, or uh, esports, um, And we're going to go, that's the short-term goal is to get those live as soon as possible. Gotcha, gotcha. And so you've, you've talked about like the, the geo fencing, I guess that's involved in, in that and like, and those sorts of things. Um, I guess we talked about in terms of challenges, you had the, the patent law kind of challenges. Were there other kind of challenges that came up? Did the patent law, the um, working with the, the sports gambling kind of licensure and other stuff, what other yeah. sort of challenges did you initially kind of have? Explaining this idea is 
if people react the way you react, like normal people understand that this is something they want to use. Mm -hmm. But when you approach a casino or a sports book, they just think, well, I don't care about risk. We've literally had people <laughs> tell us, I don't care about that risk. I can manage that. I don't, I don't whatever. I don't, I don't need to worry about balancing the book. Uh, so, you know, there's probably a blow up coming soon, <laughs> right? If they really don't right. care. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yeah, because I mean, I think for me, from a gaming perspective, um, I think I've told everybody at Wolfram this at least a couple of times and <laughs> uh, I'm going to go into, I don't have it open. I, I would like open it up and show people, but I have, I'm level 40 in Pokemon Go. And what that helped me to realize, because initially I was like, I don't understand why people even like this. Why would you like Pokemon? All I understand is Pikachu, but now I like know all these Pokemon <laughs> and everything. Um, and I've spent an embarrassing amount of money on Pokemon Go as a, an application that I can tune into and play mindlessly or like walk around in different cities. Like when I was in uh, Hong Kong, Macau, like all these places, they have special regional Pokemon that you grab them, but it's kind of like that. Um, but the interesting thing for me is that I realize that lots of people love games and they want to participate in games and they will spend money if they understand what they're doing. So yes. I don't understand this disconnect of like the casino operators or the gambling operators or fantasy sports or even like the television networks of yeah. not not quite getting getting that. But um, yeah, it's it, it's a it's a combination. So what what I think is driving it is people want to bet on real live in game action. Right. Mm -hmm. And all these other things are proxies. So the sports bets and the casinos, they they found a proxy that works over under lines, whatever. Fantasy has found us a, a different proxy that works. You have to have a portfolio. So you're not just betting on one player. They're, none of them get to exactly what people want to bet on. We're trying mm -hmm. to offer them exactly what they want. Uh, but they're all kind of proxies um, for for esports. So in Pokemon, now that you're level 40, do you still play or are you retired? <sighs> it's a difficult question. I mean, they try to intrigue me with new um different like they have like these mega pokemon now and i'll play and like they've added new features to like new network features so you can interact with your friends and play all these things that you kind of mentioned with swipe.bat in terms of trying to do that but it gets like your attention level i think um decays mm -hmm. and there's nothing that they can really do to get you back like really active and get your pocketbook kind of open again Makes because sense. it's just like once things happen it happens but that's why i see like with sports as a game and an app you guys have lots of ways to get me like back into picking up the app again and looking at it um you and know I think if, if you, there's we should chat maybe there's a way to do it for pokemon if there's some way to bet that you would find a particular pokemon in the next mm -hmm. few minutes or something right that might be a useful application yeah, I mean, I think that there are ways that they can do it because they have coins in uh -huh. game. Now, you cannot kind of take your coins <laughs> and give them to somebody else or like trade items. But I think it's getting there because like you battle with people and it would certainly be more interesting to battle with people if like you lost a Pokemon or they could use one of your Pokemon nice. or like marbles. <laughs> nice. like, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> like my dad, like my dad had this story like quite a bit ago um, where he was not allowed to play marbles because he grew up um, in a very religious household because it was gambling. Cause you know, really? you lose the marbles by, you know, oh my gosh. when you, when you play and you're actually playing the marble game, you're actually betting because they take, Oh my gosh. Um, that's crazy. So, yeah. Um, so in, in, in esports, the, the way, just so people understand the way the, it's, it's completely different from other sports, the way money is made. Uh, in, in, let's say, basketball or football or anything else, um, the, the league makes money basically from selling the live airtime, right, to ESPN or, or Disney or ABC. In esports, it's a free game, like say League of Legends. It's been around for 10 years. It's completely free to play. You, there's no way to pay money to improve your character or your abilities or anything else. Everybody is literally on the exact same playing field. The only thing they sell are little skins or chromas that, so your character looks a little different, behaves completely the same, but looks a little bit different. And maybe one or 2% of users ever spend a nickel on these games, right? Mm -hmm. But just from those one or 2%, they make billions of dollars. Wow. Just from people buying and, all these skins. And with esports, I know that this was something 
um, that um, when we talked previously about that, it seems like so complex in that they're rising and falling. How do you feel like you guys are going to, to, to keep up and like do and, and integrate oh. things in, in that kind of a, in that kind of environment? That's a great question because it's, it's something that every sports book would be worried about, right? How do you offer a bet on a game that might be gone in a year or two? But right. for us, as I was saying with Wolfram, it's so flexible. We can add it or change a game almost instantly. So as rules change, especially in esports, they have tweaks and patches every week or two. Um, if there's a new champion, if there's a new kind of abilities, things, other things that people can bet on, uh, boom, we can integrate it basically overnight. And the next day, you have a new bet on a new champion or a new map or whatever else is happening. So one of the other questions, like you talked about having like the patent and having like some of these issues that people might have, what has like the fundraising process been like? Like, how did you get your initial kind of fundraising? How do things look like for the next year or so in terms of, in terms of that process for you? So what my partner, Brett McDonald, he, uh, he's great at this. He's been in the startup business for, he's, he's one of the most entrepreneurial people I know on earth. Um, and he has a lot of contacts and he's, he pitches them. So uh, we've had some angels and stuff. We've applied to a few uh, startup incubators. Um, I think we even made it, yeah, we made it to a final round, but then they ended up not investing with us. But that was before we got the patent and now we probably don't need them anymore. Um, what would have been useful about the incubators would be their uh, network of relationships uh, that they can introduce us to a warm introduction to a sports book or a casino goes a lot longer than, you know, a message on LinkedIn. Hey, you guys like gambling? Well, check this out. Right. <laughs> that's like, that's like something you get every day on LinkedIn, actually. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that's, that's really fascinating. So, and I think, from what you said, just as kind of a little bit of a recap, um, because of your model of kind of balancing, it's like now you just seem like you need to raise money to expand your technology and to scale, right. um, as opposed to kind of backing um, the different bets, that people, which you know is phenomenal. Right. Um, but how do you anticipate being able to grow? Like, how are you? How will you get users? We have two board? models where we're working on simultaneously. One is B2C and one is B2B. With direct to consumer, um, that's a harder road uh, if we were to go it completely alone. But fortunately, we, we've partnered with a company now that has a gaming license. So we can go out and uh, market and find people and, and engage them and, and sign them up, just like any other business just starting up. Uh, the nice thing also is we don't have very high network effects. We don't need that many people to sign up. It's not like we need a Facebook or something, right? Mm -hmm. Every little marginal uh, sign up gets immediate value uh, to themselves and, and to us and to everybody else. Um, so that's number one. Uh, we also have, uh, uh, B2B. So B2B, the way it would work is we would offer to license our technology to a sports book or a casino where they would white label it. They would offer it for themselves. And it could be even to a media company. We could do it for fake money or for real money. If they're TNT or ESPN or anyone else is broadcasting the game, then they want to say, Hey, during a commercial break, you don't want people to go away. Right? So you say, Hey, what do you think will happen in the next five minutes? Go to this app, click and whether it's fake money or real money or t-shirts or whatever it is, it keeps people engaged. Um, so if we white label, it doesn't even have to have swiped up bet on it. They'll just say their name. We'll just power the technology behind it. Um, that approach where we've been working on, but it's in B2C, you want lots and lots of little teeny tiny deals, right? B2B, you want just a handful of really big deals. Um, so once a, one of those big deals happen, then there's questions of exclusivity versus non-exclusivity. Um, we, we, we're approaching both. We, we, we think either one can be uh, viable. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, and then like, I think we want to close out my kind of part of things and like go to, to questions in the audience. I did have one more question that, that I wanted to ask. Um, and it's just in general, like you notice we, or people may notice that we are all at home or, or in offices, like not, not as much around um, because there's this pandemic that's out there. How do you feel like what? that? What pandemic? <laughs> I know, right? Huh. Um, <laughs> how do you feel like that's affecting um, the landscape of kind of your business and um, the people who will, will um, use your, your app out there? Uh, it, it's beneficial to us in a couple of ways. One is uh, sports have been kind of stopped playing. Toby, you can come say hi. Uh, 
so when they do start up, um, uh, there's more attention on them. Uh, mm -hmm. The other nice thing, and they can change quickly with rule changes. So again, we can uh, quickly adapt to them. The second nice thing is, like you mentioned this earlier, you know, you have buddies, but you can't really hang out with them all the time, right? Especially because of this for forsaken pandemic. Um, but if you can watch a game together, and you know that has to be live, you can't watch a game on record, right? You're not all going to sync it up exactly. So you're all watching it live. And you can also start betting with each other. So it's a, give, it's a way of connecting across the ether, right? Even across mm -hmm. time zones. And maybe you don't even have them on the phone, but you know, you have, you have a feeling you can see how they're doing compared to you and vice versa. It's a, it's a pleasant experience. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the thing. It ties, it ties people together. And it's something that like I know from Again, like my Pokemon experience, I invite everybody out there to not only play Pokemon, um, but also play other games just so you can get an idea of like, you'll find a game for you. You may not, you may think other people's games are like silly and whatever, but you'll probably find some game for you. And if you're in um, kind of this startup frame of mind, you'll see like why it's going to be, I think this growing area where people are able to connect and, and do things together. Um, so with that, I think I will hand over more to the audience and I think Kevin will, will have questions, um, from the audience for Phil. Yeah. Um, if you, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in a chat and, uh, I'll, I'll take a look at that through that. Um, so first Phil, um, how, how and why have you used uh, Wolfram language in swipe.bet? Oh, we use it for the back end. So the front end app we uh, built, it's an interesting, so the back end we, we built, we have a running server and it's been beautiful and consistent and stable and, and remarkably good for everything that we run in the background. All of the bet matching and, and sending stuff out. Um, uh, so it runs on the server uh, and it powers the, the entire back end of the uh, app. The front end, um, we, had, we used a, we use this new programming language called Flutter, which is cross-platform. You can make an Android and an iOS app. But speaking of which, for entrepreneurs out there who know Wolfram language, and here you are, right? These are the right people. Uh, that I think there's an opportunity to make some kind of cross-platform Wolfram language enabled um, uh, app maker, right? Because the there's only so many different components in an app. Uh, a good thing to look into is like JSONet. Uh, you know, there's there's date pickers or, or labels or images or embedded HTML and all these other things. If you just write each of those and you can also connect to a Wolfram engine running locally now because the iPhones are more powerful than the space shuttle was when it launched right away, right? So if you can have the engine running locally, you can imagine all the power of Wolfram language on any app, right? And it's cross-platform. You only have to write the cross-platform part once. Uh, anyway, I think that would be awesome. I would love to have a front end that we built uh, in Wolfram as well. I have a question from John. Is your back end geo redundant? Yes. I'm actually not sure what that means. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe I don't know what it means either. I, uh, it, we have like failovers, right? So if one goes down, then we can, then another one will take its place. Uh, I see. But John, if that's not what you meant, uh, let me know. Hot remote standby. Yes. Um, and speaking of aspiring entrepreneurs, if you could offer one piece of advice to an aspiring entrepreneur, what would you say? Um, use Wolfram language. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'll tell you why, because uh, it's, it's, it's not just a cliche. Um, John, we've talked about this. We've both seen companies that have raised five, 10 or more million dollars yes. in VC funding that are literally a one-liner in Mathematica in Wolfram language. So, you know, it's, there's work to be done there. I don't know how they raise the money, but so you have to have a sales team. You have to work at it. It's business. It's not just you write a one-liner and then sit back and relax. I wish it was that easy. But if you write the one-liner, right, and then you can also tweak it and it's so much easier to, because it's all like that, um, uh, then you go out and market it and, and just know that I think the biggest hurdle to overcome is just the fact that you are able to write something useful in a very, very short, concise amount of time and it's, and it's working doesn't mean that it's not valuable, uh, right? Like, like Stephen Wolfram says, uh, the, the entire, our entire universe might be a one-liner, right? <laughs> and that's not nothing. So right. if your idea is a one-liner, it's, it's good. Right. And I know exactly the company that you're talking about. They will relate remain nameless to protect the guilty <laughs> or presume well i will presume them to be innocent i suppose I no, they're in, i'm sure they built it off the ground up they did a good job it's yeah just, yeah yeah it's, it's just, just funny that 
Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> um, John brings up another good question. Um, upon success, right? It, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, can you hire back in engineers, or are you are you will you train them in house? What is your plan for kind of hiring talent? I would uh, I would probably look to hire people who attend the Wolfram Tech Conference because those are the people who would know how to run back end Wolfram language code. Um, and then obviously not everyone knows everything, right? Wolfram language is impossible for any human being to know, uh, but th then we train them and then it's just like any other work. Mm -hmm. and just, just a, a plug in like that. That's, that's part of the point of like Eureka is, you know, we have a lot of people who are interested in um, Wolfram technology and who know how to use our technology and we gathered and all of the ones who are interested in entrepreneurship in one spot. And that makes, you know, hiring easier. That makes, um, kind of pitching your ideas and talking about your ideas easier because these are all, you know, this is like your group of people that you want to talk to, right, that you want to hire. Right. Um, so yeah, that's part of the, and again, if you're interested in joining Eureka, there's a link to that in Passable. Yeah, and I think it's such a wonderful thing you're doing. Uh, it's, it's wonderful for Wolfram because you want to have a portfolio of options, right, rather than an option on a portfolio. And it's really useful <laughs> to, the, to startups, right, because it, it's, I, I can imagine there's two groups of people that are interested. One is people who can write really good Wolfram code or, or have some ability to write some Wolfram code, right? They don't have to be the best in anything in the world, but they, have, they can express their thoughts in the Wolfram language, which is the only computational language on earth. That's one. But then you also have uh, business people who are interested in tech and, and software and everything. Uh, and they are familiar with Wolfram language, but they're, maybe they're not as expert, but they have additional skills. I think a lot of the skill of a business is something like what my, my partner Brett does is, you know, the, the soft side, the selling, the meeting people, the networking, right? That has to happen no matter how good your code is. We still are, we're still human beings. Right. Well, again, I'm going to plug for swipe.bet. You can actually go to the site. I think there's a, a demo and there's definitely a mailing list so you can kind of follow Phil on, on the journey there. Um, speaking of that, I know that there's another uh, question in a way. Um, how did you test your app initially? Because it seems like this area where you might have to like have yeah. like something different to test. Yeah, because the problem was the, yeah, real money. You know, we can't, we couldn't do real money. So we knew we had to have some kind of demo that's using fake money. What can we use that's constantly playing? What kind of sport is always on? Well, we, did, we settled on finance and we had a toy little test app of uh, 15 minute delayed Yahoo finance prices. Um, actually, I think we, we probably just use directly financial data if I remember right. Um, so it's, it's 50 minute delayed life prices and the bets, the bets that would come to your cards would be, do you think Microsoft will be up more than 1% in the next five minutes or something, right? Yes, no, yes, no. And then you track it live too. So you see how you're doing on, on all of your bets. Uh, so that's fun to play. It's obviously not, you know, you can't, it's 50 minutes delayed. So you just go, find the real <laughs> <Right>. price. <laughs> so, Here's. Ah, uh, there's a bunch of questions in chat. Let's see. Todd is asking, have you encountered any limitations in the Wolfram language that Wolfram the company have helped you overcome? Um, almost daily. <laughs> um, there's a uh, many times, uh, nothing immediate comes to mind because it just feels like a natural thing that happens all the time, whether it's on Stack Exchange and, or Wolfram Community where uh, the, or you send in a support ticket and you get a response within like a day or two from the person who wrote the code, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like that's pretty cool. And they, they'll either tell you a workaround and sometimes there are lots of easy workarounds that are just either undocumented or unclear or whatever. Um, and uh, sometimes they just, you know, file a bug report and then quickly fix it. Um, uh, so yes. Um, one of the biggest helps has been just the constant flow of new innovation that's coming from the company. Um, you know, like the, the Wolfram, uh, what is it called? The development engine, the free development engine that you can run on the cloud or uh, the, the Wolfram uh, command line interface. Those have been helpful. Uh, and, and basically anytime there's a new, you know, Steven had a bunch of announcements on a couple of days ago, things that seem like they might be interesting to pursue. Um, so, but beyond that, no, there's, I've not noticed any limitations in the sense of, my God, I, I really need to rewrite this in assembly now or C or, or even Python. That's just never happened. 
There have been, I'll tell you one thing, in one esports uh, application I did need to do, I, there's a, there was a great package in R for fast and, and, uh, fast and frugal trees, which is a really nice package. Very few people know about it, but it's useful to look at. It's different than machine learning. But anyway, um, then you, it's integrated within Mathematica. You just plug in the R library and we just ran it directly. We have the data in Mathematica, so you just call it through the external service R and boom, you get the results right back. Um, Jesse is asking, what kind of infrastructure systems do you use to integrate Wolfram Language at the back end? Do we use Web Mathematic EPC? No, um, we, as we grow, we'll probably have to do some kind of private cloud thing. But for now, uh, and up to many, many, many thousands and tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of users, uh, we just run it on, a, on servers that um, running notebooks that are live uh, with, with automatic error detection and correction and stuff like that. Um, and it's been beautiful. The nice thing is we don't have any we don't have any website clock user facing stuff that we need to run like with the web Mathematica. Um, in the past for consulting work for like the NBA, I've had to create CDFs or otherwise create well, web forms, uh, but that would just be in the public cloud and then people can use that as dashboards. Uh, but we don't have a client facing thing, thing so, uh, other than the app itself. So the, um, it would be nice to have, uh, so I guess this is answer to Todd's and Jesse's question. It would be nice. Oh, and John's too. If, if, it would be nice to have a Wolfram language app builder for mobile apps. That would be really cool to have. Um, we don't have that yet. Uh, John's also asking, have you ever reported a Wolf language defect that could not get a fix and had no workaround? Um, yes, uh, I have. Uh, and no, I don't know what no workaround means. There's no direct workaround. You can always rephrase your, reframe your question to answer it. Um, but the only reason I know I remember these is I can constantly get emails like, here's a bug you reported two years ago. It's fixed. Enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they get fixed, uh, even the hard ones, even like very rare edge cases, um, which is... <clears throat> which is not something you can get from an open source community, right? You can submit it and be like, look, this, yeah, it's on the list. Thanks. <laughs> and I've had things where I'm waiting for uh, in other open source platforms that we've used for various other projects for uh, the front end for the app building that, you know, it just never gets around. There's no tracking on it. No one cares. And uh, in one case, I, I fixed one little bug like that myself, but then it doesn't go into the main branch. So I have to constantly keep changing it from what they do. To my, anyway, it's a, it's a bit of a pain. It's, it's much better in Wolf language. So Phil, I think your um, headset might've gotten pulled out a little bit somehow. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Oh, that's, sorry great. That. that's great. That's um, great. Were there any more um, questions from the audience? I encourage you if you have questions out there, to um, to post them in the the chat. Oh, Jesse has his hand up. So I think that was just applause. I actually had asked Jesse because oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's confu like it was a confusing UI thing because it seemed like because I guess they have the uh, um, what is it like raising your hand or something on this uh, thing as they try to like oh, to Bravo. Okay, we have the subtitles here. Oh, okay, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, have, I have a question for you, John, before we go. Tell us a bit about um, the Eureka program and what your plans are for it. What are your short-term plans for the next six, 12 months? Sure. So I will actually hand that over to Kevin, and I'll allow Kevin to, to answer that. Go sure. Ahead, um, in the next six or 12 months, I think we're, we're you know, right now we've, we, so we started with like a group of people, mostly summer school school people um and we kind of went through that list and like looked at you know who who was interested in entrepreneurship and we started with them as kind of our mvp set of like uh uh people that we want to cater to right um so we started designing events around that and we're going to keep designing events as we kind of ramp up and we see you know what kind of people are interested what kind of things are they expecting from us you know in startup fashion we're, we're trying to design events and design the program as we go, right? So we're not like, we're not saying like, oh, this is set in stone. You're going to have a deliverable on XYZ date. It's more like, you know, we'll keep hosting events and we'll see, you know, what kind of feedback that they like this kind of event, what kind of events do they want to see in the future? And we'll just keep designing a program around that. So my honest answer is, I don't know. Um, That's very uh, entrepreneurial. That's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, is there a, is there a community or you know, on Wolfram community or a rocket chat or something that people can join? There is, there's a LinkedIn and I can send you the link to that. Um, so we are a closed community. So what that means is that it is, it is invite only. So you will have, uh, you will have to apply. 
Um, and once, once, once you're in, I can send you the invite link to the LinkedIn and, and you can join on there. Um, but Phil, you know, as our, as our guest speaker, I'm sure I can just send you a link. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. I would add to that's like, Kevin is someone who's been instrumental in this and really pushed to use like more startup methodology in terms of um, organizing the Eureka program itself and to try to cater to uh, the audience as people kind of um, using the initial summer school people. And then as we open it up for people to apply um, so that we will act like any other startup with Eureka awesome. as opposed to having like something that that's fixed like that. And I love the name Eureka. Apparently it's the same root as uh, heuristic and oh, heretic. Wow. And, right. So and you have to be a bit of both. You need to use heuristics to get to your answers and you have to be crazy, right? You have to go against the, you have to disrupt, right? It's wonderful. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Speaking of that with sports, um, if we could go back a little bit to like esports, like what do you see like the environment for sports being like with like live physical sports and esports? Um, and as that like progresses with technology in general, and then what do you think that means for like swipe.bet? Uh, so as they change, we're going to have the advantage, right? Because we can be flexible. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know what the future will hold. I, my understanding is real sports viewership and interest is kind of down now because of this pandemic you keep mentioning uh, that yes. apparently we have. Right. Um, uh, and, and maybe it's, it just puts things into perspective, right? That, you know, putting a ball in a hole, it's a game, right? It's not mm -hmm. last year, you know, there's a lot game. The last game of the finals potentially is tonight, right? If this were last year, I'd be like wearing a Jersey and running around, ripping my clothes off. Right. But this year it's kind of like, all right, I'll, I'll turn it on. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. And, and what do you think for esports? Because it's like, you've witnessed that, like, well, I think many of us have witnessed that, like, um, we have to spend more time indoors and yes. there are these like, so we couldn't play, like we can't go to the gym and like play basketball or for me swim, but esports are something where it's like, you can interact with people. It is. Um, yeah. What do you think it means there? Like, I think we're, we're, we're preparing for the singularity, right? Where we're going to be <laughs> uploaded and playing esports all the time or clones of us or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and one of that preparations is staying at home and playing with people and Zooming, right? So I think you're right. I think esports has gone through the roof this year because people are home. No one's really watching you, what you're doing. You're, yeah, you're working. Uh, and people are <laughs> probably even more productive by playing six hours of video games a day than just chatting and hanging out by the water cooler for six hours a day, right? They still get the same two hours of work done. <laughs> 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 um, no, in, in, indeed. And it, it seems like with swipe.bet, you guys are well positioned because you can, with Wolfram Language, integrate new sports rapidly as they kind of, and I think, Kevin, you, you mentioned this before. It's like, maybe, Kevin, can you, like, say a little bit more about um, eSports just for people who don't know, like, how rapidly they ascend and, like, fall? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I, I actually play some esports, so <laughs> no, I'm not I'm not nearly that good. I'm like, what do you play? You know, what do you play? Um, I I I played uh, League of Legends. I played Overwatch. Like usually around like the platinum kind of level. So it's it's like wow. nowhere near serious. That's you know, good, serious, man. Like, if you wanted to be like an esports player, you have to be like top. I think it's top 500 in North America. And even then, that's like nothing compared to the Koreans. Um, <laughs> that's kind of the scene, honestly. Um, but yeah, no, um, so like League of Legends, I think was, I should, you know, I should say Dota. Dota kind of started the esports kind of scene, but it didn't, I don't think it really got huge until League of Legends came around. Um, and League of Legends has managed to stick, stick around, but like Dota's kind of falling out. And then Overwatch had like a huge rise in like um, a year and a half. And then now it's kind of died out from popularity. So they kind of fade in and fast, in, in and out a lot. So I was concerned, um, Phil, I had a question for you before was like, you know, how, how would you, um, is this, do, do you see this as like a risk to your business? The fact that you can build all of this stuff for like this new game that came out and in the next two years, it just falls out of popularity and you just got to rebuild for a new game again. 
Yeah, that, that's 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 um, what we were talking about. Yeah, that's no problem for us. Oh. But you're absolutely right. It's a major problem for us, traditional sports books or casinos, right? Because they have to build up a huge infrastructure and everything else. Yeah. Do you think that like that's another question I have? Like, do you, how do you think the kind of casual, um, casual kind of um, sports? gambler sports participant because i mean it may be like what i've seen with fantasy sports is that like people still have office pools for like ncaa games and it's huge i mean it's big enough that you know we had presidents talking about their <laughs> office pool right like it's right. it's accepted and everything um but how do you see that kind of comparing to like your and then, again this is my lack of experience but i'm gonna go to casino right like you're in casino sports gambling kind of, you know, you walk up and like you, you place a bet, a bet slip type thing. Like what, what do you see like that happening? Um, and, and what do you see like swipe dot bets kind of roll like within this kind of ongoing kind of thing between casino type complex gambling and fantasy sport type more casual. And then you guys. Uh, so the first thing is that people obviously love to bet and they want to monetize their superior knowledge relative to other people. Um, the way to monetize that, the pools are great, right? The March Madness, those are fantastic uh, because that's something people can think about. Uh, will this team beat that team? That's, that's something you wake up and, and care about. Um, but like the over-unders, all that stuff people don't care about. The sports books, wages people don't care about. If you can now talk about the people who are watching the game, if they can monetize their information, how can they do that? They, their knowledge. They see, oh, they're leaving LeBron wide open, right? He's going to go off, right? He's going to go score. And you can see that, right? Mm -hmm. How do you monetize that? There's no other way except through swiped up bets. That's what we want to offer people. Gotcha. Excellent. So we, we're coming down to the last two minutes here. I just want to poll again in the, the audience to see if there are any questions out there. Um, there's, a, there's one very important question for, for Kevin uh, from Jesse. Do you see it? Yeah, what's the, I, I can't even pronounce this word. Uh, is it demonim? Jesse, we demonim. might need a, we might need a <laughs> yeah, judge we need. <laughs> <laughs> Is it Eureka? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. That's a really important question. I wake up and I think about this question every, every morning. <laughs> uh, I'll have to get back to you on that. But definitely, you know, on the top of my list. Thank you, Jesse. <laughs> Thank you, John. Alrighty. Thank well, you let's wrap up here. A big thanks to Phil Myman of Swipe.Bet. Um, really appreciate you uh, coming and, and giving this interview, the first of its type, My Eureka Moment, number one, episode number one, awesome. number one. Um, and hopefully we'll have many more of these episodes. Fantastic. I encourage you uh, to, to apply if you're interested in the Wolfram Eureka program at the bottom of the pathable description of this, there's an application and you can go ahead and do that. Um, if you have any other questions, certainly um, you can email or connect with us on pathable. Um, I'm John Woodard, Kevin Howe, and then also again, like much thanks to our, our guest here, founder, Phil Myman. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank, thank you, Kevin. Phil. Thank you, everybody. Have a Thank great you. day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.